committee of discussion on miasms I like today. Do you know the idea? Do you know why why Hahnemann reached reached the idea of miasms? Yes. He um, he saw that after administering administering the cinnamon in cases that people still became sick time after time. He would treat the They could still come back with more and more problems. Yeah. Can you give me an example of a today's case where the same thing can happen? Yes? Bronchitis, dysmenorrhea, asthma attacks that you might treat for the attack um, and successfully treat the attack and think the patient is better but then they keep getting the attack again or they might get a deeper uh, deeper disorder because the constitution or the, uh, the deeper level hasn't been touched. That's allowing that uh, to flare up to be there. Where this is more more uh, prominent is in the cases of uh, what cases? I have this peculiarity where you treat and they come back. Which are the cases which you treat and then the the condition comes back. Ear what? Ear infection. Ear infection. Chronic disorders. Chronic disorders in general, no. Catar of what kind? Chronic disorders that have acute exacerbations. Uh, yes. More specifically? Skin. Skin? skin. <coughs> no, where we find this condition mostly is in uh, treating uh, allergic condition, rhinitis and allergic, hay fever. In hay fever. In hay fever. You give a dose of sabadilla uh, at the season and then it cuts short it cuts short the, the attack. Instead of lasting for two months, three months, where is the... Usually it lasts uh, 10 days, 15 days, and then it goes away. And then ne next year it comes back. You give a Pursati, uh, Sabatilla again, may act or may not act this time. And then we, you need a deeper remedy, as we say, to clear up the condition so the, the, the attack will not come again. So this is a condition we see today, frequently, this happening. Also there is a possibility that uh, you may be treating in general. The idea is that you may be treating in general an acute exacerbation, as Corey said, an acute exacerbation. This, this thing is an acute exacerbation of a chronic condition, you see? Uh, so you are given a remedy that covers only that portion of of the chronic condition. It covers the acute exacerbation. Then you minimize that, but the underlying condition remains the same. And uh, this is one thing that Hahnemann had observed. And the second thing, what it was. That there was a common thing between many diseases, many of the chronic, chronic diseases showed similar patterns. And he saw, the first thing that he saw, he was working on Sora, and he took the combination of all... Yeah, but what brought him to the idea of Sora? The old skin disease. The? Old skin disease. Old skin disease. Old, that means reappearing during treatment. He had seen, in some cases, skin problems that a person had a long time ago reappearing. So, the fact that he was treating sometimes successfully without treating the underlying, and then on the other hand, seeing on the long run some cases that would develop conditions that have existed 10, 15 years ago. That, this combination. Also, uh, the, he had seen uh, symptomatology of gonorrhea and syphilis coming back, sort of, because they did not have this, uh, the penicillin that we have today, so they were treated very badly, there were conditions which, of which we don't know, but what he saw, he saw the coming back of these conditions, of these 
process of disease going back, thinking that it was not cured. And all these observations led him to the ideas of the Mayas. But now, let us, you see, what I want is to understand what is a miasm, what do we understand, what we should understand as a miasm, then we clarify the issue as much as we can at that stage. See, that's my questions are leading to a clarification of what we understand today to be a miasm. Was it, is it really, you see, the, 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 in, in, in uh, the theory of homeopathy, uh, we have uh, thoughts developing in different people that uh, very, they stuck to this idea that Hahnemann produced. I believe that this was an idea, a correct idea, but not exactly as Hahnemann said it that these are the three miasms which are the origination of every other disease. It's not exactly like that. It is this plus different other things. The, the fact that many of today's homeopaths, or some, not many, some, they stick strictly to this idea, makes the theory of miasms unacceptable, especially from the medical profession. Where we should present to the new camera of homeopathy, we shall present the idea of miasm on another basis altogether. Not restrict them to these three miasms. The psoric miasm, the psoric miasm, uh, Hadamant said, is due to, to the each. Each. What's the each? He meant what? Do you know did, what did he mean by each? Scabies. 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 Now, it is a little bit difficult to understand today with the knowledge that we have with the skin diseases, skin eruptions, and the variations that everything originated from scabies. It's a bit difficult. So these are questions as we probe into the question of the miasms. These are questions that we have to solve eventually, yes? Sorry, didn't I say that there's always scabies at the beginning of every... No, yes. But the way he presents his theory, it appears as if it comes. It doesn't say it very clearly. Um, What do we see now? What is our observation today? That we treat a case. And uh, we give different remedies. Huh? We give different remedies. We treat a case of asthma. And we give the best selected remedies. No effect. <laughs> or a little bit of effect. Pushing the asthma a little bit here and there. Then eventually the person says the asthma started after, after a bad flu which I had. And then the idea of the nasoid influenzinum comes into the mind. Influenzinum coming from the influenza virus type A and B I think is produced. You give it to the person. And it opens up the cases, we say. I have seen cases responding after many well-selected remedies that did not act. If the person had said that definitely the origination came from that flu, Influenzinum 200 opened up the case, which meant that it shows a really a difference now, and a difference towards the right direction. The asthma may still be there but it forms itself eventually into a picture which is clear. Then it's calicarbonicum. After influenzinum, starts bringing out coughing, uh, cough, uh, sputum, 
uh, the vitality is more, something se- seems to happen on the right direction and eventually produces a picture of Kali Carbonicum. You give Kali Carbonicum and the asthma goes much better now. We have another case where we have uh, another case of asthma and we give a lot of, other rem- a lot of remedies and none works. Then eventually we find out that in the family of that person there was a lot of cancer, especially of the lungs. Cancer, especially of the lungs. Then the mind goes into cancerinum and we give it. And it seems to open up the case again. Perhaps it does not cure, but it opens up the case. Sometimes it brings about a dramatic change, which you almost can call a cure. And then we have another case where we treat with the right remedy and does not respond. And we hear eventually that there was a lot of tuberculosis in the family. You give tuberculinum and it responds. I had another case. I'll just give you the facts and to give you an idea, a little bit of the facts actually, to give you an idea how I was arrived in this, in the conclusions that I shall, uh, I shall be giving you. I, uh, we had another case of severe headaches, chronic headaches coming recurrently uh, on a woman and uh, we tried to treat that woman with different remedies, not successfully. Eventually, I sat down and took the case more thoroughly and it appeared to me that it was a case of China sulfurica. China sulfurica. China sulfurica is the quinine, quinine, what do they call? Is the main uh, constituency of quinine, quinine? Quinine, quinine. And I asked her whether she had uh, malaria or she took Queening herself. She said no. I said, your parents? She said no. I said, you answer too fast. Are you sure that your parents did not have in their early age malaria? She said, I never heard. I said, okay, you go home and you telephone. You telephone back to tell us. In the meantime, I was sure. I said, take China Sulfurica, 10 m she goes back home, she telephones, she says, my father for years had one of the worst cases of malaria, as he tells me now, in his younger age, year after year, for several years, where he took a lot of quinine. China sulfurica brought a dramatic change in that case. There was another dramatic case of tremendous agoraphobia and claustrophobia. Tremendous. Which we treated for more than a year. She was a very rich lady coming every week to torment us for one hour, every week. (laughs) Every week, one hour, she sat there, she cried, the agony, I cannot cannot go out. In order to come to our office, she had to come with her Rolls Royce, you know, driving and first see the place and get used to it and have two people brought here there and it was a whole ceremony in order to be able to come to the office on the first place. She could only drive around her uh, block and just back home. She was very, very rich, she could go anywhere, she could go, she could take the airplane and fly anywhere, she could not go a- away from her next block. Tremendous agoraphobia. And we treated and treated and treated desperate. And uh, the idea was also that she would pay us if we cure her. (laughs) 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 She was supposed to pay quite a lot. (laughs) But for one year, seen once a week, and try our best. It was with Irini Bahas, one of my first students. I'm talking about 1969 to 70 now. 
And then, one day, after we pushed around the case, from here to there, with very careful prescribing, but one year, coming every week, I have, we have given at least 10, 10 12 remedies. And then, one, one day, the idea of hydrophobinum came. Yeah, so what is happening here? I said, did you ever be bitten by a dog? She said, yes. And do you have the rabies injection? She said, oh, yes. Because she was bitten here while she was eating food as a child, the dog tried to take the food out of her mouth and bitten her in, in the mouth here. So she had all the series of the anti-rabies injection. Well, we gave hydrophobinum in that case. And since then, it opened up the case. One, two, three remedies more, and she was cured. In all these cases, what, what we have seen is that there was an initial, and many, many other cases. Many cases where you need penicillin, you need uh, cases that have taken a lot of penicillin, and finally, you give penicillin in order to open up the case. You give cortisone. What, what showed to me all these cases that was an initial cause that has created a predisposition for a chronic disorder in the system of the person and that predisposition which was originating from a specific cause was it a microbe or virus, a drug, a chemical, it was transmitted because the woman with China sulfurica, it was her father who had the quinine a lot before she was born. So there is a cause and can create a predisposition that can be transmitted from one generation to another. And unless this layer, this predisposition is counteracted by the appropriate remedy which corresponds to that particular layer, then there is no progress in your cases. That puts the theory of miasms on a completely different understanding. It is there is always in all of us a kind of layer of disease which can be Who is reading this? Huh? This is for the cases. Oh, your case. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a layer, <coughs> and uh, this. Three, this, these three uh, graphs represent three different remedies and maybe they correspond to one layer. It doesn't have to be one remedy, one layer. Now what is the difference between three layers and one layer? How do we understand that it was three layers that was one miasm, one miasmatic uh, 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 predisposition. Three layers, one mathematic. Why do we say three in that case and one in this? Hydrophobinum was one remedy that took away that layer. Influenzinum, it was one remedy that took away that layer. China sulfurica was one remedy that took. But sometimes 
you need three remedies to take away a layer. In which case you will say, no, we need a three remedies here. In which case? Can anybody tell me? It's difficult because I ask the question. Yes? Well, is the question, when do we know we remove the layer? Is that the yes. I think when we get the jump in the level of health. Yes, that's right. This is, this is the idea. Once we really get a quantum jump, not, not a slight improvement, but something regenerates the body, then that means we have struck eventually a layer. That can happen with your third remedy. Here you may be prescribing Ignatia, Sipia, and Natrum Muriaticum. And on Natrum Muriaticum really shows the difference. In that, when she takes the third remedy, yes, oh, that goes very good. But unless you have given Ignatia and Sipia before, she could not have taken. So there is a sequence here that you have to follow in order to remove a myas, a miasmatic la layer. So a miasmatic layer has to have, in order to establish itself, has to have a beginning, I mean some origination. The origination can be, as we said, a microbe or a virus or a drug. And therefore, we may be talking about the tubercular miasm. We might be talking about the cancerous, cancerinic miasm. We may be talking about the malaria myas. We may be talking about the influenza, the influenza myas. We may be talking about the psora myas. Though I believe that in psora myas is not one, but several psoric uh, predispositions, myas. So the idea of the miasms is not strictly gonorrhea, syphilis, and psora, but you have to get the idea of layers that you have to take away before the health of the people are freed and becomes uh, really balanced. You have to have one, two, three. And there is a sequence. If you go straight to the third, you see there is no effect. You have to go to first, second, third. That, that necessarily gives you the idea that it has to be a layer on top. First layer. And then a second layer. And then a third layer. You cannot go and give a remedy right to the bottom where a sulfur some, sometimes now in practice, what happens? Sometimes you have a case where you give medorinum. But before you give medorinum, you say, now, is it sulfur or it's medorinum? There are some elements of sulfur in that case. But medorinum, you say, is more prominent. You give it first. You give it first and it works. It takes away a lot of things. Makes the person better, feels better. Then comes natum muriaticum, and then rustox, and then sulfur. Then, as you treat a person for five, six, ten years, you eventually come to sulfur. But if you have given it to him prematurely, he will not have acted. You have to give it on a specific sequence. Now, which is that sequence is very difficult to know from the beginning. We have ideas. We have hints about the different remedies that may be indicated in a person. What we try to do every time in the analysis we make, it is what is the uppermost miasmatic layer. But not anymore, we must not think miasmatic layers as syphilis, <coughs> uh, whatever, uh, gonorrhea, uh, psora. We should get away from that idea. Because what do you need? You need a viral variolinum after smallpox. Eh? After smallpox vaccination, 
They say you give thuya. Sometimes you will need virolinum. You will need the variola, potentized, to take away the predisposition. That is a mild. The variola has created, the vaccination has created a miasmatic predisposition to the person. And you have to take it away unless he takes violinum. Then, then you see the beautiful, how, how they develop the cases. We have cases, we give, we, give homeopathy, we give homeopathic treatment to the cases. And then they do some good, well, and a little bit this, and a little bit that. And this, what we do actually in such cases, we prescribe on close or underlying possibilities. We do not prescribe all the first possibility. We do not go one, two, three. We go three, two, four, five, three again, two, not one. But first, you have, you, have, you have first to give number one, which is uppermost. If you are going to open up the case to, to, to relieve really and to make real changes. I have not seen, you see, one of the parameters for a miasma is the possibility to be transmitted from generation to generation. We have to have that possibility in order to call it a miasma. A genetic change. Genetic change. I'm sure we, we, they, they, there's going to be some time where we are going to find the genes of the, uh, of the person. We are going to find these uh, positions and these uh, discrepancies that will indicate this or that disease. They, they are doing it now, actually, with the recent uh, uh, research in uh, the genetics. Therefore, what we have to develop... So the idea of the miasm is not simple. It is not... Uh, neither, I think, anybody has really touched the idea of Maya so far from a practical point of view. What we have to do is to collect information eventually and see what is the viral linum, what will have as prominent symptomatology in a person, in a person, in a person who has been affected by, by, by variola and that has stayed on the, as uppermost all the time. Collect this information and have it, and then be able to use it in a practical way. What is the cancerinum, the cancerinic myas? What are, what are the possibilities of this person getting cancer, and why? And then, as we collect all this information, more and more information, more and more, the cancerinic myas will become more and more evident. The same with syphilis, the same with uh, gonorrhea. So we have, we have signs now to go by in syphilis, because syphilis, due to the fact that it was a, system, a systematic disease that went right through inside the body, you know, from, uh, from external mucous membranes, went to the uh, to the vascular system or to the nervous system. And then we know more or less the progress. Then when we see diseases, we may say this is uh, the syphilitic myas or the gonorrhea also. We have signs to indicate that most probably this person, the, his uppermost layer is psychosis, is uh, psychotic. Sure. But we have a lot of information still to know before. We can say the uppermost layer in that person is cancerinic, the uppermost layer is tuberculinic, the uppermost layer is syphilitic, the uppermost layer is malaria, the, etc. Influenzino. You see, so the, the idea of the miasm is there, definitely, 
but with the difference that it is not only just three three causes initial causes but there are much more causes yes when you've given um, influenza, for instance, or yes. for instance, in retrospect, have you actually found that there have been symptoms there that would correspond to the provings of cortisone or influenza, or have you in fact just prescribed on, 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 on a flash or whatever you, and found that it worked? No, uh, really has happened the other way. That means it has, something has given me the hint from the symptomatology, oh, that might be cancerinum, or that might be influenzinum, that might be uh, variolinum, etc. And then I prescribed it. And then we have the feedback. And then we collect that information. But the information has to be collected by somebody who knows so much about homeopathy and not confuse syphilitic with psychotic, with psoric, with cancerinic, with tuberculous, myos. And has to clarify and give clear information about the different miasms. There has been some kind of uh, information coming from different people, especially the South, South Americans, and uh, especially from uh, uh, Ortega, who is very much, very much uh, stuck to some ideas that all miasms originate from syphilis, psychosis, and syphilis, psychosis, and uh, psora. But history shows that tuberculosis was there before syphilis. So you cannot say that tuberculosis is the result of psora plus syphilis. And then he has given a guiding lines for, uh, for Psora. He says, the Psora inhibits, inhibits, inhibits the syphilis distorts, uh, what's called, uh, no, not this, right, distorts, distorts, uh, there's another word for uh, somebody who is not normal is uh, per perversion. 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 And uh, psychosis is explosion, something which explodes. This as ideas may be, may be uh, appealing. And uh, uh, if you try to apply this, you will see that it does not work. Because eventually, we, what we are interested in is to find a remedy, one remedy for a person. Huh? And that remedy can be syphilitic or psychotic or psoric. But if we have the theory, and we say, oh, this person is psoric, but his remedy is medorinum that comes up. What are we going to do? Because he's psoric, we don't give medorinum? Because he's psoric, we say, oh, he's psoric, so he inhibited and things like that, and uh, uh, we don't give medorinum. Any other remedy will not work. So I am a little bit intolerant of ideas which have no practical value, especially when you are dealing with serious cases where you have, you have to be accurate every time. I'm a little bit impatient with theories that just confuse the mind. And the theory of the Mayas is good, first of all, to know the prognosis of the case.
So the idea is to know how many mayas, if it is possible, if we knew how many mayas this person has, we shall have a quite accurate prognosis for him. A person with four miasms, four miasmatic layers, is a, too much. Eh? A person with one miasmatic layer is well off. That's the idea now that this theory comes to a practical use. Then, when we present cases, when we see cases, we may be looking on the case from that point of view. Now, what is, according to your understanding, a person who miasmatically is not so much affected? What will be the parameters? <coughs> what will present if he is not very badly miasmatically affected? That means he's not having five miasms. <coughs> he, he has one miasm. Then what will be the parameters? They have good vitality. They have good vitality. They will probably have acute diseases rather than chronic. Acute diseases are chronic. They'll probably only need one remedy for the yes. rest of the time. Uh, mentally and emotionally, they'll probably require. Mentally and emotionally. A good family history. A good family history. I think the disease would tend to be uh, functional disorders as opposed to uh, yeah. Very good. These are the parameters. What you said, all of you, if you put them together, are the parameters which show that a person is not, and his, especially, the first parameter is his remedy. It appears. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you try to treat this kind of people, hmm, and an intellectual, I will tell you something else also, it's not an intellectual, it's just a, ge a, a general term, an intellectual. You know, a professor of the university is an intellectual? Not necessarily. Eh? He has some knowledge that he presents it in a nice way, in a correct way, systematic, etc. He may not be an intellectual at all. An intellectual, what is his... If you put him down, really down, an intellectual, to what, what is the quality? Can one tell me what is the quality? He tries to explain everything. He tries to explain. For a, Analytica. What? Pride. Pride. Questioning. Questioning. Independent. Independent. Trying to understand. Trying to understand. Separated, separated from his own nature. Yes. Uh, I would say, I would say another word with nobody used is the person who most of everybody else doubts. He doubts about everything. Questioning. Somebody said questioning. He doubts. I says, is things like that, but it can't be this way, or it can't be that way. Therefore, an intellectual can present, can, can persuade you that this board is not a green color. It is what you see, your eyes. Why? Because your eyes have a particular uh, shape, and therefore, depending on the, on the lens of your, uh, that you see that. In reality, this is black. <laughs> and you say, hell, maybe if we had very small uh, lenses, we'll see that black. Yes, he's right. That's an intellectual. <laughs> yes, because he has thought, what is this? We see something, it depends on the size of the lens of the eye. So if I see him and he wheels and on, I said, I recognize him because as, as, as a particular shape, because of the lens. If I had the lens of the cat, maybe I will see something else. If I had another lens, I will see some uh, etheric bodies also. And then if I see that, then I see nothing. 
as material, but I see. Uh, and then you say, yes, he's right. Then eventually you say, oh, can I touch this man? You exist. <laughs> because he has persuaded you that he doesn't exist. He says, you go back now. <laughs> you see, hey, where, where we start, where we are. Now that is the intellectual. Now, a person that has gone now too much into this inquiring, doubting everything, is a person who essentially, essentially, I must say, is a person who is, how can I say, who is healthy in, uh, or uh, rather I put it this way, is a person who is happy or unhappy. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Wait a moment. Uh, <laughs> you see, the intellectual, me, me, the <laughs> argument can't. <laughs> um, usually, usually is a person who has suffered a lot, who has suffered in his life, who try to find out what is suffering, where suffering comes from. And that are initial questions for him that, that started him on the journey of qu query. Where, why do I suffer, why? Now, we come back to our ideas. We say that an intellectual is a person difficult to treat. Therefore, a person who has a lot of miasmatic influences. A person who has a lot of miasmatic influences. His remedy is never clear. Therefore, a person who is suffering a lot in his health. But a person who is also at the same time the leader of the society, one who goes first. Therefore, the conclusion will come that suffering is necessary to harness our selves and to help us in a kind of evolution of the human being. So we come to the conclusion finally that miasmatic influences, the more we have, the more we suffer, the more we tend to go towards finding what is true. That means identifying ourselves with that which is true. Therefore, miasms is a necessary condition for the human race in order to evolve. I will tell you something else. I will ask you another question. An intellectual, <clears throat> a pure intellectual, is a person that will kill out of instinct in order to survive, in order to... It's very difficult that you will find an intellectual that will, will destroy instinctively. Therefore, the suffering that he has gone through and the inquiry has made him a better human being for the society in general and not so much instinctively uh, instinctively uh, driven and, uh, and, and destroying. You see the the red, uh, what what's called the mouse 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 people? What were called these people? Mouse, uh, the red red guards, yes. the red guards, the red guards. I mean, you must have heard what atrocities and what cruelties they have committed when they have given some power. 
this is an instinctive drive for survival and for authority, etc. But they have destroyed others. I mean, these instincts, these people on Bangladesh, if you remember, the reports from Bangladesh was terrible. What was happening there? What a human being was, was doing to another human being? The war in uh, Vietnam, the Viet Cong, etc. I mean, where the primitive instincts of man came up really, and you, we could see, they say, this is man in a primitive state. They said, oh my God, where we are? Then we need myasm, give us myasm. You see, give more myasm, give more diseases, give. I mean, make the people, harness them, make them suffer really. And then they become uh, less and less uh, instinctive and uh, destroying. Just let me, let me complete my ideas, and then, and then we'll see. Now, <laughs> now, the question is then, uh, shall uh, we leave the people uh, untreated in order, <laughs> through suffering, to become better and better, or shall we treat? No, because one, two. Them, got them through. Yeah. The idea is that they have learned their lesson. Once they come, these people to be treated, they have learned their lessons, and you free them. You free them from miasma. They feel the freedom, and they feel what? You see this movement which happens: the hippie movements, the 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 drug culture, etc. What happens is people. People trying to get into a state of mind, we say, which they, they call it a state of uh, samadhi, some, a state of freedom, a state of unification with it. But they cannot. Once you treat such people, eh, they go and have experiences, spiritual experiences, that they could not have before. I mean, free them from, from the, their miasmatic tendencies. They experience, they have experience of spiritual uh, understanding much more than before. Therefore, you are helping them in their effort to evolve spiritually. They are ready to be helped. And they come to you, who, who is a good prescriber, you know what you are doing, and then you give the right remedy, and then you free them, etc. So, even that we are uh, trying our best to cure people, we shall always find some difficulties and some problems. Why? Because the question, the next question comes, how the whole idea of miasms originated? How it must have originated? And there Kendall says that, and which I believe it is true, it has originated. He says, man thinks wrongly, started thinking wrongly, wrong things, and then eventually brought upon himself a predisposition for a kind of disease. And then the disease came, treated wrongly, and then it became worse. And then gave the predisposition to his children, etc., etc. And then next generation, next generation, until we reached that state of affairs in which we are today, which is a terrible state of health. We're having a terrible state of health today in our world. The more advanced a, a, in technology a country is, the worse and the more difficult it is to treat these individuals of these countries. Go to America to treat some cases. Gee. <laughs> Because, especially, go to the West. 
they're the worst cases you can find, the intellectuals. They mix up, I mean, the people, they will never tell you, they will never give you a symptom of what we are talking about. They will tell you all kinds of theories. You see, I am uh, allergic to milk, he says. What he means by that is that from time to time there comes a crisis inside him that he feels he's going out of his mind completely and he wants to take a machine gun and kill everybody who is in front of him. And he calls that, I'm allergic to milk. <laughs> and then you write, uh, allergic to milk. <laughs> and I'm allergic to Farinaceous food. Why? He says, that whenever I have noticed that whenever I take financial food, I want to take the machine gun and kill the people. But in order to get into that root of the matter, we say impact is to kill. It's a whole battle because it's the farinaceous food and it's the milk and it is this and the <laughs> allergy and the allergy. What do you mean by allergy? I, I just don't feel well. Yes, but what is that you don't feel well? You see, it depends. Or do what depends? It depends on the mood, on the side, where maybe I sit sometimes on the sea and I don't feel well, then sometimes in the mountain I don't feel well. I mean, he has intellectual eyes. He says, oh, why do I have these impulses? Because I was sitting next to the sea, most probably, and I have drinking milk an hour ago. <laughs> he comes to be treated by you, he gives you no... I mean, it would be interesting <laughs> if I had a case. It didn't come out on video, unfortunately. I will show you that case. I mean, I, I was, it was a total loss for me. A nice lady. Not an intellectual, but through this, taking all these drugs, etc., it's the product of the society. Which is, you know, the, the world, somebody said, is going towards California. Okay. It's progressing. I mean, California is the pioneers, the pioneers. Now, in California, there is a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ocean. So they jump, you know, they reach there and they jump. <laughs> this is the idea that the world is presented at the moment. <laughs> That's why I'm going to California. <laughs> you see, there is an energy there. I'll tell you. In Esselen, who was in Esselen? George, you were in Esselen, yes, yes. In Esalen, Esalen is an institute, talking on my asthma, you see, it's very appropriate. Esalen is an institute in uh, California where all crazy things, whatever craziness you can imagine, takes place in a scientific way. <laughs> well, uh, uh, some of my students had a connection with the SLN and said uh, we do the, the seminar in SLN. I did not know what was SLN. <laughs> in SLN took part first the counter groups, the encounter groups, you know the encounter groups? Uh, took the first, uh, the first uh, experiments in drugs, uh, the first experiments in all kinds of polarities, molarities, etc. God knows what. <laughs> God knows what. What was going on? There you see a place full of strange energy. Strange energy in that, in, in that institute where anything, anything can happen. So we, we walk. It's a big place like, like uh, Alonisos. No, not as big. I mean, as Rusum Yalos and Patiri. No place like that where they plant their own, they dig and they plant their own drags. But the first thing that you meet is uh, everybody works naked there. Nobody wears anything. <laughs> so, so we walk there in the place and... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we see, and we see all these phenomena taking place. So don't take no, it's okay, I mean this... <laughs> <laughs> it's very natural. It happens here. Yes, people, uh, they like to take some sun, and uh, all the parts of the body has to take the sunshine. It was a strange, strange energy, really, was developing, even in the seminar, and uh, everybody was feeling, finally, after a month, 
We had a month, an intensive month. I don't know how many hours every day. Everybody was just falling over the cliff almost <laughs> in the end. It was, it was an experience. <laughs> so the whole world is going towards California. What we see in California is going to happen to us unless we have some kind of wisdom which is uh, not going towards the tide. The tide goes towards California. We have to understand, to evaluate, and, and be able to kind of counteract this tide. Otherwise, <laughs> I see everybody reaches that energy, the California energy, and then jumps into the ocean, jumping into chaos, jumping into suicide, jumping into darkness, into confusion, into all kinds of experiments, spiritual, all, all kinds of spiritual experiments will take place there. So, we need the miasms to harness us, to make more, to bring, bring on more suffering. <coughs> but when we are ready, when we are ready for a cure, then the appropriate homeopath will be found. <laughs> and that is what I hope we are preparing. Yes, George. In your philosophy, when you say we're well, justifying treating, yes. you say they have learned their lesson. Yes. In your philosophy, have they learned their lesson through the suffering they've already encountered, or through the suffering plus the administration of the remedy? How do they learn their lesson? They learn the lesson before the remedy. Definitely. I feel that the person who is ready for a cure has learned his lessons through suffering. He's ready to be cured. Otherwise, now, how this, how this will come? In some cases, I will show you. I will say, now this man, you see, he is so fixed in his ideas, in his beliefs, which appear to be wrong from an objective point of view. How much fixed he is, there is no possibility that he will be cured. He has to change. He has to take some drastic changes to let the remedy act. Otherwise, you will see a relapse. And then in his relapse will not come to you. I've seen cases doing well for a while, relapsing, say, oh, homeopathy also did not help me, and going around. And then after five, six, seven, ten years, they come back and they say, you have helped me that moment. You, why didn't you come back? Because I relapsed. And I thought, you, you cannot do anything also. But I went to different other doctors for five, six years more suffering. Then he comes back. Now he understands. And this is, it was the experience of Kent also. Exactly the same thing Kent has also written somewhere in his lesser writings, I think. So we see that this is a matter of maturity. The person is right now. He's mature. Now he stays with the treatment. And he's freed where another one will not stay in the treatment, will, will try all kinds of things, will counteract what you did for him. He wants a quick cure. You say, you, you, cannot, you cannot, you cannot go further. This is what I can do for you. He's not happy. He goes, tries, he wants a quick cure, then a relapse. Yeah, there comes a person who is so bad that you feel the hell. Why, I, why should I cure him? You know, he has been killing people, he has been doing this, he has been doing that, he has been doing that. It's not for you to judge that. Neither we can understand why he has come and whether his time is ripe. If his time is ripe, you are going to give him the right remedy, he's, he's be cured. If he's not, his time is not ripe, you try as much as you like, you will not find his remedy. If his time is not ripe, you try hard, you find his remedy, he will counteract it within a month or two. So there are, for us, is to learn as precisely as possible that science which is really a science and apply it. And not expect 
all the time, cures, cures. You cannot do it, otherwise you will be disappointed, never mind how, well, how, how good you are. You will have some cases where you cannot uh, really help, and then you will be disappointed. If you expect, I can cure everybody. <coughs> no. But if you know these things, then more or less you know whom you can cure, how much far you can go, and this is what I hope that you will be learning through the process. Well, therefore, uh, there is already on my side, it has been done some work on collecting information about the Mayasms, but it's not yet ready to give it out to the, to the world. I have not given it to the Greeks or to anybody. Uh, it is a process still that when I have it completed, I, will, I shall give it to you, definitely. But as main ideas, you, you can be working also on these ideas yourselves now. And uh, collect information, and we are going to work as a group, and I need your cooperation, because I cannot see all cases. You say, I have seen that case, it's interesting. I prescribe all this and then influenzinum, and he did these changes. Try to, try to be objective in your observation after the remedy, eh? Try to be ob objective. He says, I, uh, I'm so well, I'm this, I'm that, perhaps. And you see, no change. Don't be misled. You see, I had cases where they come and tell me, oh, uh, I'm, I, I'm better, my um, asthma is better and all that, and I do not see the changes I want to see. And I said, oh my God, nothing. It's just a placebo effect. Be objective. Also, don't be over-objective. That means you miss, you miss the main point. You miss the changes that have taken place. You see the person is another person. And you write, maybe he's better. Now you what is maybe he's better? It's another person altogether. Make that remark, otherwise you tend to change your remedy. If you don't understand what, what deep changes have taken place in that person. You have taken deep changes, don't touch it for little things that they will complain. <laughs>